I want to welcome you to the Pro Mindset Podcast. The Pro Mindset Podcast is all about diving into the headspace that results in championship performance. High performing athletes, winners, have this mental flow and have a positive headspace for their performances and success. Join me, Craig Doman, sports attorney and NFL agent, on this podcast. I will interview pro athletes, college athletes, football coaches, and sports personalities. Together, we can discover how you can get in the flow and have your own pro mindset. Today on Pro Mindset, I have Rob Ninkovich, New England Patriots, two-time Super Bowl winner, played 11 years in the NFL and walked out on his own terms. And we're going to start out today talking about what's it like on game day. Game day is game day is confidence, and it's a it's a combination of your training and your practice and your belief in yourself, and it's confidence knowing that even if the play even if they call a defensive play, I mean, I don't, I don't know if I remember. If, like, I think one time we talked, and I said I'm gonna be dropping this whole damn game anyway. But I had like two picks. You know, it's like I think it's the mentality of going into the game knowing no matter what, I'm still gonna make good, big plays. Just if it's not in the, like, if it's not rushing the quarterback, it's gonna be some other way. You know, You're gonna make something happen regardless of what you're rolling. Yes. Okay, Rob. Tell everyone what your foundational principles for success were leading up to your NFL career. Um, you know, I, I think just values, the values that my parents installed in me at a young age of never giving up, never quitting. So I think that's number one, never having that that feeling inside that I can't get it done or I can't get the job done. Number two is, is confidence in yourself. So I was always confident that I could do everything that I wanted to do as long as, number three, I had the work ethic and I put forth the effort. So if you don't ever give up on something, you have the belief that you can do it and you put in the effort to get it done, then your chances of being successful are very, very high. And when you're younger, I think a lot of younger adults or younger teenager, teenagers are very impressionable on what others will think of them and at at a certain point now that i'm older i don't give a shit or i don't care about what people think about me and i and i do believe that young the younger you are when you realize that the more success you're going to have and at a young age i kind of told myself well this is what i want to do this is where i want to be this is where i want to go and if i have to cut out certain things in my life certain people in my life that are going to affect me and going to change the direction that I want to go, then that's what I'm going to have to do. So, you know, young adults, young kids, teenagers, they go out and they drink and they go to parties. And, and that's the one thing I think is, is, as when I look back, that was absent. You know, when I think about college, I don't think about parties. Um, I think about training and I think about going to school because school didn't come easy to me. Um, so making sure that I had the grades so I just could play football. That was my number one. I had football on the brain. Like, that's all I thought about. I wanted to be a great football player. I knew that if I had the intangibles of knowing, understanding the concepts of the, concepts of the game, working out and being physically one of the stronger guys on the field, that was always going to help me and take me where I needed to be. So I think it's making that choice early and not listening to outside sources or noise, ignoring the noise or the outside world telling you what you should be doing, how you should be doing it, if you can or can't do it. That'll hot air. That's just noise. That's just people trying to bring you down. And in our society, our world, everyone loves to bring people down. So for me, um, I think learning those, those valuable lessons early really set me up to have the success that I had. Okay, so Robbie, you went to three Super Bowls, should have won three, you won two. And most of the guys that play in the NFL don't even get to play in one. Yep. What was the highlight of your – I mean, you played 11 years. What is the highlight of your career? Was it winning one of those Super Bowls? Was it winning the first one? Was What was your highlight? Um, I think the Super Bowl, yeah, that's that's always a huge accomplishment. 
I, I think when you when you can get to the Super Bowl and you can attain that the ultimate goal as a as a kid, you you will grow up watching the Super Bowl. We all dream of that. But I think number one would be checking off the list. And I, I, when I was a kid, I had goals written down, and one was to play in the NFL. One was to start in the NFL. Another one was to be a playmaker, be a difference maker in the NFL, win a Super Bowl. And when you can count all those things off, when you can check all those off the box, I think that was one of my greatest accomplishments, looking back on everything that I had written down and I was able to check it off. So greatest accomplishment in just winning a football game? Yeah, Super Bowl, my first one. Um, Greatest accomplishment as a football player in, in total would probably be maximizing the God-given talents that I, that I was given in football. We all have a certain gift from God. God gives us the ability to give him the glory in playing football, being a good person in society, giving back to the community, all those platforms that you're given as a football player. I think that I maximized all those things, and when I look back, I'm really happy and proud that I was able to do that because I feel like God's happy with the things that I was able to do with the talents that he gave me. You know, there's nothing worse than guys that have talents that never are really utilized and never maximized and never used. You set these goals. How old were you when you set your goals? I have goals. I have, a like, it's funny. I was a freshman in high school, and I would write down, I would write down things that I wanted to be next year. Um, so I have weight. Like I have bench press of things that as a football player, you need to be able to do. And I would write them down. So I'd say 14 is when I first wrote down my goals. And by chance, do you still have your goals somewhere? I, I still have those. Yes, I do. Well, I would highly recommend that you frame your goals from when you're 14 and put a check mark by all the ones that you attained and show those to your kids when they're at the age that they can understand what this is about. Yep. I actually had a – what I did is I would take my stickers and the things that were on my helmet and take them off and put them on a, like, piece of construction paper and write the goals next to them (laughs) for the next year. And I have a box for all that. It's funny. Well, I'm going to bounce around on you. Share with us what was your best and fondest memory of Purdue? playing at Purdue? Uh, my fondest memory, I would say early, like like when I first arrived at Purdue, I had such a, I guess, a a, a picture of what a Division One athlete was in my head. So I had never, I played at junior college and, and Division One football, Purdue, Big Ten, you know, it gives you this, this false reality of what a football player should be or should look like. So I was like obsessed with making sure that I was strong and and fast. And, like, when I hit the ground, when I hit the ground at Purdue, I was like, I'm going to be sprinting. Like, I'm going to make sure that when I go there, like, I can measure up to these great elite athletes. And one of my first memories is when I walked, when I walked into Purdue, I looked at, like, Anthony Spencer, and I was like, well, this guy is freaking big and strong, but he's, I, I think being him, like, comparable, like, as far as athletes, and then just building relationships, you know, having a good friendship with Anthony Spencer and having a good relationship with Ray Edwards and Brock Spack and Joe Tiller. You know, I think those are the things in football that you build that you can't get back. You can't ever build the relationships that you have in football in any other sport, any other outside world thing, because you're maybe, maybe the military, I compare it to the military because you're putting in so much time, blood, sweat, tears, um, you go through camp, you go through boot boot camp, so to speak, of losing your identity as a person and trying to become a team. You form a team, and when you do that, you form these relationships um, that are that are awesome. So I think that the relationships, and then just playing in a Big Ten football game. I played the year before, or before I went to Peru. I was playing in front of 100, 100 people. Um, the first game at Peru, we played Syracuse at home. It was 60,000, you know, I think that was my first time actually playing in front of a lot of people. That was like, wow, this is crazy. So it was pretty awesome. It was definitely 
a great stepping stone for me to test myself physically, mentally, and to get the next get to the next level, um, which was the NFL. Well, then, Robbie, you were drafted in the fifth round by Sean Payton and the New Orleans Saints, and you made the active 53. What was the toughest thing when you look back at your rookie year? What was the toughest thing you had to overcome to make the 53 out of the jump? Uh, you know, I think it was just the what people see you as, the stereotypes that go into being, you know, a white defensive lineman going into the NFL as a fifth-round pick. You are more so looked at as maybe a special teams piece or, um, you know, this guy can help us uh, on kickoff and punting, but maybe defense, I don't think so. Um, so for me, I think it was just turning enough heads in pass rush and one-on-one situations to where they believed that I was a guy that they could put on the field and trust that – trust enough where, okay, get him on the field, he's going to make plays. There's not going to be any liabilities here with him on the football field. So what happened about your third or fourth game running down on kickoff for the Saints? Yeah, yeah so uh, I unfortunately my rookie year was short, cut short in the Monday night game against the Falcons. I, you know, had a good – first two games were great. I future was looking great. Um, played against the Browns and the Green Bay Packers. So we had two away games the first two games of that season in 2006. You know, I was in some great plays, some key plays. Played about 25 snaps on defense, which is a good amount for a rookie. Was the third defensive end. They only had three active guys on the roster. So everything was looking great for me. And then we played the first home opening game in the Superdome after Katrina. It was a game. That was the Steve Gleason block punt. Um, I was on that. It was called Pistol. That was the name of the play on our block punt. And I was out running down on a kickoff right after, I think it was a Terrence Copper reverse for a touchdown. In the previous two weeks, John Bonamigo, my special teams coach, said, Rob, I want you to be like one of the first guys down there. And as a young guy, you're very – gullible to, yeah, all right, I'll be the first one down there. So I can remember that all week, that that full week uh, preparing for the Falcons. I was trying to get off with Gleason. I was trying to run with Steve, who was faster than me. And in that game, it was a deep kick right. The ball was landed on like the one-yard line right by the pylon. So I was running to the ball, and the return for them was probably, I'd probably say left alley wedge. So the, the wedge was coming to me. And I was trying to get to the ball before the wedge. And when I got hit by the wedge, I wasn't kind of ready for it. I tried to brace myself with my right leg. And when that happened, I hit and braced at the same time and hurt my knee, which was an ACL injury. It took me out of my first rookie season, it took me out, out for the rest of the year. And that was it. That was uh, the start of my battle to get back onto an active roster. It took me about three years after that to be a – substantial lock on a roster it did so you come back your second season and the biggest obstacle you got to overcome is now you're damaged goods and you're coming off an acl and you showed you obviously showed flashes of excellence so you wouldn't have made the 53 in the first place the the rookie here and so your hugest accomplishment goal was you know put yourself back where you were you know be on the 53 again and show them that you can play. And I can remember being in Indianapolis. It was the Thursday night, opening night game. And I believe it was after the Colts' Super Bowl or something, and that's why they were hosting it. And I get a call from the general manager, and he says that the Saints were letting you go. And this was like, I don't know, 1 o'clock in the afternoon or something like that. And I was like, holy smokes, dude. I said, why are they cutting them? You know, I'm thinking in the back of my head, you know, not Robbie to do this, but did he do something he shouldn't have did? Because there's like no makes no sense. You know, you don't fly from New Orleans to to um, Italy, being on the traveling roster, and then get let go on game day. So I asked the general manager what's up, and he said, I don't know. I'll I'll talk to Sean, Coach Peyton, and I'll get back to you. Well, he called me back ten minutes later and said that they wanted to activate a fourth quarterback. Yeah. And I'm like, holy smokes, dude. You know that's stupid. So I knew you had a bunch of family. And your mom and dad and your sis driving down I-65 when when you made the call to your sis. But why don't you share for the audience how your dad responded when <laughs> your sister finally told told him what was up? Well, we, 
There's a nickname for him that we called him after that. We called him Mallard. Mallard. Because no. when he Mallard because when he got the news he said, Get me get me off the interstate and he instantly went to a gas station, ripped off his uh Saints shirt and threw it in the dumpster in the gas station and bought a duck, Mallard duck, just like straight up duck T shirt from the gas station and uh proceeded to go home after that game and throw every saint piece of item that he had off the balcony of the house and threw it all away and said, F the same. So that was, yeah, that was a tough time for me because I had come back from my ACL, but it was a tough time, but a valuable lesson in life for me that once you hit a certain age, everything is all business. And sometimes, business is good sometimes business is bad and if you are not a starter or a valuable piece to a team you're expendable and um, at that time I was coming back from my ACL I had unfortunately been hurt my other knee my other knee was hurt because I hurt my MCL in training camp Um, they had this kid Andy Alleman I think he was drafted third round by the Saints uh, got thrown and landed on my knee and tore my MCL I think the hardest lesson for me in that one was sometimes you can't trust everybody. And I had a discussion with Sean Payton and some of the guys with the Saints organization. And, you know, they want, they really needed me to practice for the, the Thursday game. They needed extra bodies on practice. So I did what I could. I put a brace on and I taped myself up and, you know, may, might not have been a hundred percent, but I did it because, you know, that's the type of person I am. Whatever I got to do to help the team, I'll do it. So, when they cut me that time, it was shocking to me. I literally just at breakfast, and, and they said, we're cutting you. So then I was like, all right, well, they cut me. Now what do I do? Do I go home with you guys? What's going on? Like, And then you go through the waiver process, and you can be picked up by anybody. So I tried to just not put myself in a real stressful position and just say, okay, well, this is out of my hands. I can't control anything right now. When I have the next opportunity to control something, then I guess I'll try and do that the best that I can. So it was upsetting. It was very frustrating for me, but that's life sometimes. You can't control certain things. Well, the blessing in disguise is you got picked up by the Miami Dolphins the next day. Yep. waivers. And you go down to Miami, and they're 0-14 to start the year, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it was Maybe a terrible it was year. I don't know if it was a blessing. I don't know if it was a blessing. No, well, it's a blessing because how things turned out. Every, every like place you went in your journey, contributed to success. Your ultimate success. Yeah. So you go yeah. down to Miami, and you know you're you're playing for a brand new NFL rookie head coach, Cam Cameron, and you guys are 0 and 14. You end up 0 and 15. I happened to be at the game where you guys won. You beat the Ravens in overtime, if I'm not mistaken. Greg, fans, Camar- just, Greg Camarillo did a slant for a touchdown by Cleo Lemon. Got him a, yep. got, a, got out of the history books. Thanks. Got out of the history books, being the, the first franchise to, to win them all and lose them all. Okay. Yep. Right? And so the fans were going absolutely nuts after the game, you know, running around the uh, concourse of the stadium. And then I remember having a conversation with you after the season, because I do with all my guys, which is, hey, make sure when you have your exit interview, you ask your coach, like, hey, how are you doing? What can I do to get better? You know, how do you see me in the future? What kind of role can I play for your organization? And would you mind sharing for everyone what the one and done, because Cam Cameron got fired a few days after he had his conversation with you, what he shared with you on that day? Well, I uh, I, I wanted to have an opportunity to play. And, look, there's – in the NFL, there is some certain things that happen that make certain teams never get over the hump and they always lose and they're never going to be a, a winning team because of the way that they're run or the way that things happen. And in that discussion, you know, I, I wanted to know simply how, what do I need to do to play? And his response was, well, you know, we have the, the guys that we had on the team were what we thought our best options were at winning. And for me, that was a really dumb response because they didn't win any games. So I knew at that point that I probably wasn't going to work out unless that whole staff was gone. 
and my my only saving grace was with uh, the GM at the time that he was the one that wanted me there, saw the potential in me, and he was the one that would tell me, you know, just you know, got to be patient. I'm the one that wants you here. I I saw the things in you that are gonna be that could be potentially good, and you just got to be patient. And then they sure enough, everybody got fired. So GM, head coach, everybody got fired. So at that particular point. I really had no idea who was going to be there, you know, what type of system was coming in. Um, and that's when they hired Parcells and uh, Sperano. So Bill Parcells came in as like the director. You had Sperano come in as the head coach. And that was, that was kind of maybe not the best thing for me as a outside linebacker because Bill Parcells walked up to me, put his hand on my shoulder, and said, you're the Ninkovich kid from Purdue. I remember you because he was with Dallas when I was coming out. He compared me to Brewski and said, I you're an inside linebacker. And that was that was the start to another journey. And, and, uh, oh, my goodness. Yeah, yeah, so they they went from uh, 4-3 to 3-4, I believe. Yeah. And they moved yeah. you to Mike Backer, one of the Mike Backers. So that was a great – that was great. That whole situation was awesome. I uh, I had a great training camp, was an outside linebacker, did really well at outside linebacker, had led the team in sacks, um, thought I had a good chance of making the team, got called into Parcell's office, and uh, he said, you know, I think you would be a great inside linebacker. You know, as far as height and weight, you don't look as like an outside linebacker in the scheme. So what I'm going to give you is an opportunity to stick around here for 11 weeks with your – full salary on practice squad so you're going to make what you're going to make as an active player but you're on the practice squad but this is a one-time thing if you shake my hand now we'll honor it if not you're cut so i said all right well I, i'll do this i will learn how to play inside linebacker waited they brought me up to play against the raiders jeff ireland was actually the gm at the time yep when i after the game i you know i think i ran down on kickoff nothing crazy after the game that next week they called me in the office he said they were looking for a better a bigger spark on special teams and compared me to he said i thought you'd be more like a larry Izzo type so he compared me to larry Izzo. i instantly in my head thought to myself i said i'm six three two sixty you know larry Izzo is a, a different guy yeah he's like five eleven. yeah great football player but you know i'm, I'm not that so you can compare me to Larry Izzo, but not in that particular instance. I, I I didn't think that Larry Izzo, that was a good comparison because, you know, Larry had played a very long time in the NFL, was a big standout on special teams, but I was a com- completely different body type, different player. At that point, they released me, and they were like, you're going to go back on the practice squad, and then I was kind of fed up with it. I was done. Um, I got a call from the Saints. They said, hey, we're interested. We need – we need a, a defensive end. We have a couple guys, you know, that was when Will Smith and Charles Grant had the star caps dietary supplement issue. They were going to be suspended for the end of the year. So I said, yeah, I'm gone. I, I wanted to go because I knew I could get my credited season. That would help towards my pension and all that stuff. So I didn't even tell the Dolphins. I didn't give them an option to bring me back up. I just left. I didn't, I didn't tell anybody. So when I went back to New Orleans, there was, a 54 man exempt clause put in because they pushed the suspension of Will and Charles to the next season. So they didn't have to serve the suspension. So they were available, available to play. So I was kind of like the guy that was messed up in that deal because I was just left the team for another team. And then the team that signed me didn't need me. So they put me on an, an exempt list, which, that wasn't awesome. I didn't play that year, but I, at least I got my um, credit season. Well, here's what I remember in year three when the Dolphins activated you for that one game and they let you go. I called Jeff Ireland to ask him how you did, and he said you didn't show enough. Yeah. And I'd already talked to you to find out you played. You ran down on like three kickoffs and two of them were touchbacks or something like that. It was like you really didn't get a chance. Yeah. And so I, I called bullshit out with Jeff. I was like, come on, dude. You didn't give this guy a real shot. And then you went to New Orleans, and you, you got caught up in that situation, but at least you were getting accredited season, being an active roster and all that stuff. 
And then going into year four, you show up for OTAs and, and you're one of your best friends, Sean Payton, had a talk with you. What happened in that conversation? Yeah, well, in that off season, they had, uh, you know, given Bobby McCray a big contract for, he was from Jacksonville, big defensive end, 6'6", six, six, looked great, looked the part. They had Will Smith, first round pick. They had Charles Grant, first round pick, big contracts. They had uh, Jeff Charleston, who was like a special turn, um, good kid, love Jeff. But when I was coming in OTAs and minicamp, like off season, I was just like, all right, well, I'm I'm ready to just compete. I don't care. I, I can compete against the best of them, all of them. And uh, we were going, I remember I was at practice and, and Sean walked up to me and he said, uh, you know, your only way, the only chance you have of making this roster is as our long snapper. <laughs> and I, I remember looking at him like, this guy is serious. Like he really thinks that I can just, that's all I have. That's, that, that's my option here. So I uh, looked at him and I said, well, if that's my only opportunity, I'll take, I'll, I'll, take the challenge and went right into snapping every day. I would snap like a hundred footballs a day, all filmed because they had Kevin Hauser at the time. And that was when the whole uh, movie ticket, movie tax credit scandal had happened. Unfortunately to Kevin, he had a few uh, coaches and some players money invested and the money disappeared. So then they directly took that out on him and, um, he was out of there. They knew, you knew they were going to cut him. So, you know, for me, I was like, okay, well, then maybe this is just my only opportunity now. Um, it's been about three years. It's my fourth season. I hadn't played since so one to make the roster. Um, so did everything that I could continue to train as if I was going to play football. I didn't stop training and running and doing everything that as a defensive player would do. Um, so I trained like I was going to play defense. First day of training camp, I, I remember I reported to camp, and uh, right before I even hit the door, they said, "Hey, Sean wants to speak to you." So I knew right then and there. I said, "This is going to be great." Um, well, they had just signed Jason Kyle. Who they had just signed camp. Jason. Yeah, they just yeah for Carolina Panthers for like ten, eleven years, and he was a seasoned vet. You know, played at uh, Arizona State, and I don't know why. Uh, Carolina didn't keep him because he's one of the best long snappers in the league at the time. I just think that, you know, sometimes you just want to change players and they were just kind of looking to go in a different direction. But now New Orleans had him, and so they kicked you to the curb because they didn't want to take up an extra roster spot for two long snappers in camp. Yeah. Um, so they cut me. I, I looked at Sean. I said, well, you didn't know about this a week ago because um, at this point rosters are set and people – kind of already have their list of guys that they think are going to be on their team on the roster for camp. And uh, he, he said, well, we didn't know it. We didn't know two weeks ago that we were going to do this move. Um, so for me, I was really angry. at that point. I was motivated and ready to do it. I wanted to, I didn't, I, I was able to control myself. And uh, then the fate struck again. And, and the next day I was contacted by the, the Patriots and, and, that's when the, the my career took off. Absolutely. No. So what happened was they brought you in for a tryout. When guys come in for tryouts, you know, one in 20 chance they'll sign them. They signed you. So what was your attitude and what was your perspective once you were going to practice and, and playing with the preseason for New England? Well, I knew that I had to turn heads. I had to be – I had to get attention from the coaches and people that are scouting – and the best way to do that is to get to the quarterback, win your one-on-one, play fast, play on special teams. I didn't know the playbook at the time, but at, when I first arrived there, Matty P was my position coach. Matt Patricia, Matty Patricia was my position coach. You know, I'm playing next to Teddy Bruschi, like these guys that are Patriot Hall of Famers. And, and I just remember thinking to myself, like, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm in New England. I know that if I can just, show value to the Patriots and Bill Belichick. He says it every year that he doesn't care who you are, where you're from, your contract status. If you can help win, win football games, you'll be here on the team. Um, I remember just saying to myself, I, I have to just turn heads and I have to show them that I'm a pass rusher because a pass rusher, if you can get to the quarterback, you're valuable. So for me, it was going against the best competition 
if you go against the best and you beat the best, that's when you earn respect and you have people look at you and say, well, look at this guy. Because if you, anytime you go against the third string tackle and you don't win, then there's something wrong. So if I was a starting caliber defensive player going against a third string or a backup tackle, there's no way that there's that one single rep should go his way. I should win every single time. So for me, it was, I'm going to go against the best guys. I'm going to go against Matt Light. I'm going to go against the starters. I'm going to beat those guys. And if I can beat those guys, then I'll start turning heads and people will start recognizing me and the things that I'm doing. Well, this is what I remember. I think it was roughly after the third preseason game. I got a call from you and you said, hey, this is what went down after the, after the game. Well, early in camp, the first, the, one of the first days in training camp, I um, – it was actually the first day at one on ones. I was the uh, nobody knew who I was. I just came onto the field. They're, they're already a week in a training camp, so I was the new guy, which at you know wearing forty five, like nobody respects the new guy until you prove yourself. So they were doing one on one pass rush, one on ones, and and I just went against Matt Light, and I knew like, look, this guy's Purdue, Purdue Boilermaker, good football player, played a long time, Pro Bowler, multi ring super bowl champion um blind side tom brady's side tackle if i can beat him it'll be good for me so i go against matt beat him dante scarnecchia is the offensive line coach freaks out like what the heck is that mad at matt says let's do it again and pass rush is a it's a chess match it's uh it's i show you one thing you think one thing i do the next thing and then it's a, it's a dance going back and forth on how you change things up. So the first rush, I beat him on the edge. So I figure, okay, he's going to probably set me. If I jump the, so he's going to try and jump the set line. I do an inside move, clean, beat him twice. Starnecki gets really mad, says, all right, let's do this again, light. So then you, you beat a guy with speed. You beat a guy with power. What's the next thing out of the, the pass? Full rush, rush baby. Is a bull rush. So um, you go with speed, get the guy on his heels, and then you stick your right foot, your side foot in the ground, and you go right at him, and you try and run him over. And I, he almost hit the ground. He fell, like went backwards, arms fell, and just went right past him. So I beat him three times in a row. And and Bill, after these practices, has high and low lights. He said he highlighted me. And he said, "Look, this guy's been here one day." This is what we want. This is what we're looking for in pass rush. This is what we want. And uh, he said, by the time we're done with him, he won't know what he's doing. I still to this day don't get what that meant. Um, but I think, <laughs> I think it was by the – I think him, he was trying to say by the time we get into his head with all the things that we teach here, he'll, he won't be doing these things. But uh, then fast forward into the, the postseason, I was really uh, high motor trying to get to every ball, trying to get to – every single play and I had a big I had a good good preseason his point out to everybody was with effort and if you play with this type of effort you will make a team so you will make a roster if you play like this I just told myself I I don't care what the call is I don't care where I'm at on the field I'm going to make a play I'm going to get to the ball I'm going to be like like an energizer bunny never stop that was, okay, I need to play on special teams. I understood my role. And if you can do that, then they try to overload you. They try to put so much on the plate to see, well, what can this guy handle? And there was a point in time where I was on kickoff, kickoff return, punt, punt return, um, and playing on every snap on defense. And after the season was over, I think it was after 2011, Bill walked up to me and said, he doesn't get many compliments, but he said, you had a full plate and you did really well. And I just remember thinking to myself, all right, that's good. So pay me coach, pay me. Thank you. Yeah. Right. And he said, he said <laughs> we're not going to pay you, but you're going to play a lot. So um, yeah, exactly. So what is, what is the, what's the Patriot way? What's the Patriot mindset, you know, playing there eight years and going to the Super Bowl three times and winning the, winning the division. Every year. Did you guys win the division every year? Yep, I won every every year you won, I played. You won the division every single year you were on that team. Every single year. Yep. What is your mindset and what's the Patriot way? 
my mindset is to be the best football player that I could possibly be. And the Patriot way is how can I be the best football player I can possibly be for my team? And when you have a group of guys that have that same collective mentality of, I'm not thinking about my contract situation. I'm not thinking about anything beyond me being a great football player. I'm not thinking about the end of the season. I'm going to try and work on myself and what is my role. And then you take that role and you embrace your role and when you have a collective team of guys who understand their roles and they embrace their roles and they love each other and they come together as a team, that's when special things happen. And I was lucky enough to be on special teams where guys were accountable. They knew their role. They played for one another. And I can remember, I can remember all the bad plays on a good team you don't think about your great plays. You think about what plays you need to work on to be a better player. And when you have a team full of guys that just want to play better and just play for the guy next to them, that's when special things happen. Amen. That's how you win championships. Yep. There's a lot of a lot of teams in the NFL have got great players and they don't win. They, they can't win in the playoffs. They can't even get to the playoffs. I mean, look at the, you look at some of the teams right now with loaded rosters. There's no way – the Cleveland Browns or the Dallas Cowboys should be underachieving the way that they are with the talent that is on that roster. Um, but it, all comes, it comes down to where your mind is. What, what exterior and, or factors come into play when you have expectations and not being able to manage those expectations and hype of outside media fueling the hype? And at the end of the day, you got to play 16 games. And if you can put it together and win, it doesn't take. It's not the most talented team that wins. It's the most hardworking, detail-oriented, mistake-free football team that wins games. Uh, Bill Belichick's a hell of a coach. What What can you say about Belichick? That I mean, everybody knows he's a he's a master of psychology. He does a lot of relational football. He is very detailed. He he wants everybody to be you know fold into the Patriot culture and not have a bunch of individuals. What are people, you know, that you can talk about? What can you say about him that people don't know about him? Well, I think, you know, the one thing that, that you respect is the consistency. Um, he's very consistent. He's not changing. So Bill's not going to change for a player. He's, gonna, he's not changed for anybody. He's going to be very consistent in his evaluations and honest opinions of, of what he sees. And then, you know, outside of football, there is, there's Bill Belichick who he's got a sense of humor. He is, he does smile. He does laugh. He, he enjoys um, football, but that is his true love. His passion is football. He wants to talk football. He wants to dive into scheme and, and understanding scheme and figuring out different things and the defense. He loves everything about football. So, you know that he lives, he lives, breathes, eats football. That's all he does is football, and uh, you respect that. So, I don't. There's not another football person that that I respect more than Bill. I think he's a tremendous coach. He gave me an opportunity to play football and play for a long time, um, win Super Bowls. Yes, would I have liked to have made more money? Of course, but at the end of the day, when you play. At championship level in a in an organization that has won for a very long time, you figure out quickly that there are perks to your post career playing that help you along the way with playing for the Patriots. I tell you, I wouldn't be in the position that I'm at right now if I was playing for a Cleveland Browns or Cincinnati Bengals. Um, I can guarantee I wouldn't be on ESPN and doing a commentating of the things that I'm doing. So, what are the things that a lot of players don't appreciate when they're in the NFL is when you play for a championship team in a city and an area that appreciates champions, what are the opportunities that you've gotten in, in the Boston area that you might not have gotten if you were somewhere else? Yeah, I mean, you look at the, the market of Boston or New York or some of these bigger cities, there's a lot more opportunity when you're done playing football. Um, so you're working at ESPN – you know, on Thursdays and Fridays, I've been all over the country this fall, and every time I look up, it's Rob Nikovich on ESPN talking about something or somebody or some team or some coach, and you've got a national platform being with ESPN. 
what's been the most rewarding and most challenging thing of being in that in that limelight? Well, I think the challenge is not everyone loves the Patriots, right? So you're going to have your people that are that don't like me just because of the fact that I played for the Patriots. That's fine. I get that. But and you don't you care also, if people like you. I don't care. You don't care don't what people care. say. I don't care what people say, but yeah. I a, a, a challenge would be, you know, we live in a world today where every single thing you say is, is scrutinized and can be blown out of proportion or blown into thing that you're not meaning to try and make it. So I think the challenge is you have to be fair. Um, you have to be smart in everything that you say, especially with certain topics that are brought up and, that's the challenge, but I think the rewarding part is I'm still involved in the games where I watch games and I have to watch the game as if I was still playing because I want to be fair and I want to talk about the players because I know how hard it is and I don't want to be unfair on certain people based on not understanding the situation or, or what the game was or what the certain player had to try and do. I'll never say just. That's a lesson I learned a long time ago. Because if you could just tackle them or just catch the ball or just throw it, everyone who says it would be in the NFL, they'd be in the Hall of Fame. So, you know, for me, I try to break it down into simple, why did this happen? How does it happen? What do you do moving forward? Um, What is this team? What do they need to do to be better? Um, and what has happened to them? Why are they not in the place where they should be? So that's kind of how I take it. I, I take it as, a, as, as an ex-football player that knows how hard football actually is. It's not easy. Um, so I'm never going to just completely throw someone under the bus or say, why did they just do this? You know, because tackling Gurley in the open space, open field is very hard, you know. No doubt. And you're in, in some respects, you're like a coach or a consultant without having to put in the hours that coaches put in. Yes. I mean, coaching is definitely something that could potentially, I mean, it, 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 I think about it, but then I think about the time that I wouldn't be with my kids and a lot of the thoughts in my head on, do I want to continue to play football? were basically all derived from my kids, you know, because when you, once you have kids, you start thinking about long-term stuff, you know, how long do I want to play football? Do I want to risk my health? Um, because I need to be around for these little guys, and uh, I have three, so they keep me busy, and I, and I love it. I love being a dad. You know, I think the greatest accomplish, uh, accomplishment that I have done as a, as a person, um, as a man, has been being a father. I think it's been, it's been one of the most rewarding things that I have done um, in my life. Give everybody the ages of your kids. You have a daughter? Yes, so I have a six-year-old girl. Um, I have a three-year-old boy, and I have a five-month-old boy as well. So I have, my oldest is a girl and then twice. So it's not. Girl, boy, boy. So you did the Doman plan because we went girl, boy, boy as well. Yep. It's, um, uh, it's pretty fun. I, I mean, I really, I love it. I, I, I think I love being a dad and watching my kids more than I do, than I did playing football, honestly. Robbie, what was the most surreal part of coming back from uh, the Super Bowl against the Falcons, which ultimately, was that your last NFL game? Yep, that was my last game. Yep, coming that back. was your last game. So you guys are losing twenty-eight to three at one point. What was going through your head, and what was the the environment like, and the the, the mojo like on the on your sidelines? Well, honestly, when you're in that game, you just don't want to you don't want to have such a poor performance like that because it's embarrassing. It's the Super Bowl; everyone's watching. So I think uh, everybody, when we walked into the locker room. We were more so disappointed that we were performing at a level that we knew was not us. It was not – that wasn't what we had been about. That wasn't the way we wanted to play that game. So I think it was just a collective confidence that if we can get things back in order, back on track, we just got to take it one play at a time and not start thinking about the outcome of this thing. You know, I think before – 2000 before we played the Seahawks um, Bill had given our the team a speech the night before the game and it resonated with me because when we lost to the Giants in in Indianapolis in 2012 I remember in that game we were up and I remember looking at the scoreboard and saying to myself 
we're going to do this. We're going to win this game. And then sure enough, we lose. And when we were playing Seattle, Bill had said at, at any point in this game, if you start to think about the outcome or the score, I want you to get yourself right back into the moment of where you're at, what you're supposed to do, what your job is, and focus on doing your job and winning the down, winning your down. If you can win your down, which is every single snap, you you go into the snap and you think, I'm going to win this down. I'm going to beat the guy across from me. I'm going to do my job. Then everything takes care of itself. When you start to think about the outcome of things before the job is done, that's when things can start to go the wrong way. So for me, and for that Seattle game, I just told myself I'm going to play my heart out. I'm going to do everything I can to win this football game, and we did. And then with the Falcons game at halftime, everybody just made the commitment to each other. Let's go out here, try and put together a, a game, a second half that is that is respectable. Because in the first half, it was dis, it was disrespectful. We were putting on a disrespectful showing of what we were. Well, I agree that when you start looking at the outcome and you start watching the scoreboard, it impacts how you play. When you're when you're behind, you play stressed out and tight. And when you're way ahead, you start coasting, and then you don't make the plays you should make. So the guys that can focus on just making the play, live in the moment, win the moment, win the play, and then the clock run hits zero. The fat lady starts singing. Most of the time, you're going to be successful because you put together 55, 60, 70 good plays. Yep. So okay. I think there's there's a very easy way to manage if you had a good or a bad a bad game. This is this is my own technique, and if I was ever a coach, this is or this is how I would do it. You take every snap you're in the game. If you're in the game, 50 snaps, you just count good and bad. You have winning plays and you have losing plays. If you win more snaps than you lose, you have a winning performance. If you lose more snaps, you're probably going to lose a game. So, you know, when I was graded tape, I always it was it was easy for me to say that was a winning play, that was a losing play. I lost, I won. So then you just tally it up, and you want to have more wins than losses. And if you can do that, then you have a good game. Then you have a respectable game. Absolutely. Okay, Robbie. You have your NFL career in your rearview mirror. You now have the luxury of being a ESPN broadcaster that really talk. You're a talking head now. You yep. you're evaluating and, and commentating about other players and their performances. What could you with with those with the benefit of those two roles, being an 11 year pro, winning a couple Super Bowls, now being a commentator. What would you tell your 22-year-old self now that you couldn't tell yourself when you were leaving Purdue because you didn't know? Trust the process that God has a plan for everybody. And sometimes when you're younger, you feel like you can control certain things. But that's really just God testing your, your will and your mental toughness. And he wants to see, you know, what, what, how do you respond to certain situations? Um, and I think as a 22-year-old, I might have been a little bit more, I've been able to do this on my own, and I was able to work hard and get to this spot where in reality, you know, as I sit here as a retired football player, that was God's path for me was to go to New Orleans and find my wife, get injured, have the trials and tribulations, the rough seas to get to where I was going and then now I have three kids, and there's always going to be some type of obstacle. How you respond to it, it's the strength that you carry on through those obstacles that really makes or breaks the character of what you are as a person. So for me, I would probably tell myself at 22, like, look, there's things that are going to happen, but that's, that's, God's, that's God's plan for you. So buckle up, buddy. Put on your seatbelt. It's coming. Yep. Well, Rob Nikovich. You have a tremendous reputation and legacy with the Patriots. And you carry down the tradition of number 50 on the defensive side of the ball. And it was a pleasure working with you. I'm so proud of you and everything that you've accomplished. 
most importantly, I'm, I'm proud of just the way you handled your career and your post-career with race. And I think the thing that epitomizes Rob Ninkovich almost more than anything is your retirement ceremony when Robert Kraft, Bill Belichick, and all your teammates are there, and you've got your beautiful wife, Paige, and everybody is honoring you. And what people don't realize about the NFL is that most of the time when guys retire, they just say, hey, bro, don't let the door hit your ass on the way out. Yeah. And in the history of the New England Patriots and that franchise and all the successes they've had, you played a very vital role in that. And I just commend you and wish you nothing but uh, continued success. Thanks, Craig. I, I appreciate your mentorship over the years. And and sometimes the father-like figure that you've been for me to, you know, as a, as a younger athlete, you go through struggles that you need to talk to somebody, and you're always there for me. So I really appreciate that. All right, man. Have a great weekend. I appreciate it, Rob. Thank you for listening to this episode of Pro Mindset. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. Five stars, of course. You can follow us on our website, ProMindsetPodcast.com, or on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at ProMindsetPodcast. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you the next time.